And it's wonderful to have you joining us here tonight. This hour is the opportunity for us to celebrate you and the important work that you make possible. 90% of the support for the foundation comes through your generosity. I look forward to introducing you to the most recent winners of our physiatric research grant support. Thanks also go to corporate sponsors, the Allergan Foundation, Aspen Spinal Bracing, Encompass, and Mertz. Dr. Ross Safant, my friend and renowned researcher and chair of our research awards and grants review committee is up next. Take it away, Ross. Thank you, Bruce. It's uh, a joy to be with you here tonight. All of you, I wish we could all be together having our proverbial snacks and wine, etc. cetera. But, but this is an important event anyway. The Foundation for PMNR does something important. It helps make the profession one day better every day. If we don't support our young people, we are not going in the right direction. The PMNR Foundation is what helps lead us forward. I'm gonna present the first award. It is the recipient of the Allergan Foundation Neural Rehabilitation Research Grant, and that is Dr. Preti Raghavan from Johns Hopkins University. Preddy is investigating the feasibility of a kinetic-based citizen science telerehabilitation platform. Of no surprise to me and others, this is Dr. Radovan's third foundation research grant, and she is doing stunning work in motor recovery. Congratulations, Preddy. Hello everyone, my name is Preeti Raghavan and I am grateful to the Foundation of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation for selecting my proposal for the Allergan Foundation Neurologic Rehabilitation Award. The title of the proposal is Feasibility of a Kinect-based Citizen Science Tele-Rehabilitation Platform. And the proposal was designed to answer the question how can we motivate individuals with stroke to participate in rehabilitation at home? As you can imagine, this is particularly critical during the time of the pandemic when many patients with stroke are stuck at home, unable to receive services. This proposal was created in collaboration with Dr. Maurizio Porfiri from the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. He created a citizen science platform to motivate individuals. Citizen science projects enable members of the public to take part in scientific research to address real world problems. In this case, he designed a platform to identify environmental hazards along a canal in New York City. But the question is, how can we facilitate the interaction of a patient with stroke with the platform. That is not easy because patients can't really interact so easily with a mouse, a typical mouse. So I worked with graduate student Ronnie Barak Ventura to design a dowel that patients can hold with both hands and perform specific movements to interact with the citizen science platform. Now, when holding the dowel, the intact limb can help move the affected shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints to interact with the computer. So for example, if the individual needs to make a selection, they need to flex and extend their elbow. In order to move the cursor up and down, they need to flex and extend their shoulder. In order to move the cursor left and right, they need to abduct and adduct the shoulder. And they can use forearm rotation and wrist flexion and extension to pan the image left and right or up and down. By performing these movements in this manner, we can also quantify the movements at the various upper limb joints and examine the quality of the movements as shown here. The aims of this particular study 
are to evaluate the usability of the platform with stroke patients, specifically to examine the cognitive and physical capacity of patients to use the platform independently without the aid of another person. To assess the efficacy of citizen science in motivating patients to perform exercises and to test whether the platform can reliably capture movements of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints. This work will be performed at the Motor Recovery Research Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, and it will support research personnel who will collect and analyze the data. Thank you once again, Foundation of PMNR, for allowing us to do this work. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, for just a second, I'd also like to thank my uh, co-conspirator in crime on the Research Awards and Grants Review Subcommittee, Dr. Elliot Roth of the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Northwestern. I'd also now like to turn to the recipient of the Aspen Spinal Bracing Research Grant. That is Dr. Greg Decker from Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Decker's research is on pain and functional improvement following utilization of a lumbrosacral orthosis for acute episodes of low back pain, a randomized control trial. We look forward to Dr. Decker's video. Hello, I'm Greg Decker and I'm from the Physical Medicine and Rehab Division of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Washington University in St. Louis. I'd like to thank the Foundation and Aspen Bracing for the Aspen Medical Products Spinal Bracing Research Grant. Together with my co-investigator, Dr. Heidi Prather, we will use this grant money to fund our project entitled Pain and Function Improvement Following Utilization of a Lumbosacral Orthosis for Acute Episodes of Low Back Pain a randomized controlled trial. With this project, we plan to investigate the utility of an LSO in the management of acute directional bias, low back pain, in addition to standard care. We are gonna recruit patients from an orthopedic injury clinic and randomize them into usual care alone versus usual care with the LSO. Our outcomes will include a numeric pain rating scale, Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, Promise, Pain Interference, Anxiety and Depression, with primary endpoints at seven and 14 days. We will also determine if there's a difference between the groups in terms of medication use, ordering of advanced imaging, and total cost of treatment. We hope this study will help contribute to the standard of care for acute low back pain. Again, thank you to the foundation and Aspen Bracing for help support this research. Thank you, Greg. Well appreciated that fine review of that wonderful project. Next, I'd like to talk to a, a, a special award, and that is the Richard Madison ERF New Investigator Grant. Dr. Madison was a sentinel contributor to the field of physical medicine rehabilitation. The foundation provides this Richard Madison ERF New Investigator Grant each year to support a young investigator five years or less out of training. This year's winner is Dr. Cole Cheney from the University of Utah. Uh, he is being awarded for his research on neuroma cooled radiofrequency ablation, <coughs> the treatment of refractory phantom re and residual limb pain, a pilot study. We look forward to his video. Hello, my name is Cole Cheney and I'm a PGY4 at the University of Utah. I'm honored to accept the Richard S. Maderson ERF New Investigator Grant for my project, Neuroma Cooled Radiofrequency Ablation for Refractory Phantom and Residual Limb Pain, a pilot study. This is a project I've had in mind since PGY2 year. I'm the son, grandson, grandnephew, and nephew of prosthetists and orthotists. I knew I wanted to help amputees, but I also knew I wanted to do it differently than my family. This grant will help me continue to do the research 
that will benefit the amputee, rehabilitation, and pain population. Our clinical team was comprised of myself, Dr. Zachary McCormick, Dr. Colby Hansen, Dr. Richard Kendall, Dr. Chris Duncan, Shelley Cunningham, Bo Sperry, Dr. Aaron Conger, and Dr. Taylor Burnham. Our team was based out of the University of Utah. The study was based on a case study we had previously published, which had looked at cooled radiofrequency ablation for residual limb and phantom limb pain in a single patient. This patient had recalcitrant phantom and residual limb pain. An MRI identified a neuroma in the infrapiriformis distribution. Using ultrasound guidance to identify the neuroma and fluoroscopy to avoid important anatomic landmarks associated with other peripheral nerves, we were able to use cooled radiofrequency ablation to ablate the distal stalk of the neuroma. At eight weeks post ablation, the patient reported nearly 100% improvement in phantom limb pain symptoms. And at six months, the patient reported 95% reduction in phantom limb symptoms. Such profound and durable pain relief from this procedure inspired us to expand our protocol. While radiofrequency ablation is not a completely novel technique for phantom and residual limb pain. No one has ever evaluated cooled radiofrequency ablation in this patient population. Cooled radiofrequency ablation uses a thermal probe, but with an adjacent water system that helps control the surrounding tissue heat during thermal ablation. This picture depicts both probe and the tubing system required to pump the cooled water. Due to the often traumatic or surgical severance of residual limb nerves, the nerve course can often be irregular. Standard radiofrequency ablation requires a very specific angle of approach to achieve thermal ablation, which can be challenging in our amputee population. Cooled radiofrequency ablation, on the other hand, projects a spherical lesion, making the thermal nerve ablation much more achievable. Whether this confers more significant or more durable pain relief for our patients is the intention of our study. In addition to evaluating pain outcomes, we will also be tracking adverse events related to the procedure, patient pain medication use, prosthesis use, and ability to perform activities of daily living. On behalf of my University of Utah family and the patients we serve, I'm honored to accept this award. Lovely, Dr. Chaney. That was great. Um, the next awardee is someone I know, uh, Dr. Ginger Polish from Spalding, Mass General Brigham and Harvard University is receiving a new investigator award for her research on rhythmic auditory stimulations for functional gait disorder. We look forward to Ginger's video. Functional neurological disorder, or FND, is a common neuropsychiatric condition in which the nervous system functions abnormally in the absence of any known structural neuropathology. Rehabilitation strategies for this population are largely understudied, and with the help of the Richard S. Matterson Education Research Fund of the Foundation for Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, we want to change that. My name is Ginger Polich, and I'm part of a team of clinicians at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. Here we treat many patients with motor FMD, which can affect gait, balance, coordination, and strength, using physical therapy and sometimes psychotherapy. 
In recent years, functional neuroimaging studies have started to show what types of brain activity is underlying FND. And abnormalities have been found in parts of the brain involved in motor programming, emotional processing, and attention regulation. My name is Lauren Carter, and I'm a physical therapist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And one of the things that I specialize in is treating patients with a functional gait disorder. Functional gait disorder is characterized by an abnormal walking pattern that is inconsistent with an organic etiology, such as a stroke, MS, or Parkinson's. While individual presentations do vary, the most common symptoms include ambulating while dragging a functioning weak leg, ambulating with small, slow steps or a swaying gait, demonstrating sudden knee buckling, or walking with a hyperkinetic gait pattern, which is when an individual will demonstrate excessive movements at their trunk or limbs. Our team at the Brigham is interested in exploring whether music and rhythm, which acts on many of these same networks and has been found to help normalize gait patterns in other neurological conditions, could also be helpful for patients who have F and D. My name is Caitlin Head and I am a Neurologic Music Therapist for MedRhythms and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. In an inpatient setting, Neurologic Music Therapy works in co-treatment with physical therapy to use music to improve someone's walking. Through neuroimaging, music has been shown to have a widespread activation in our brain, activating not only the auditory cortex, but also motor planning regions. When we as humans passively listen to music with a regular beat, we are able to entrain to that rhythm, priming our motor system for coordinated movements. This intervention is called rhythmic auditory stimulation and harnesses the brain's ability to synchronize movements to improve areas of gait or related to movements. It has been most commonly used for patients with a stroke, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's, and other neurologic injury or diseases. Up until recent, we had never experienced how the effects could improve someone's walking for individuals who have FND. With physical therapy, we seek to optimize a patient's gait mechanics through creating an exercise program that is feasible for a patient to perform on a regular basis, as well as educating them on symptom management strategies to facilitate normalization of their movement patterns. Our team will be conducting a pilot study using rhythmic auditory stimulation for functional gait disorders. We'll assess patients at baseline after the intervention and at three month follow up. And this will include a combination of patient self-assessments, standardized physical therapy metrics, as well as kinematic measurements recorded through gait sensors. Our aims in this study are to assess feasibility of this intervention for F and D, and also see whether this intervention warrants further inquiry through a larger randomized controlled trial. This pilot study is the first step and we could not do it without your support. So thank you again, Foundation of PMNR, for making this happen. Thank you, Ginger, for a lovely video. Our next uh, winner is uh, someone many of us know. Uh, he is the recipient of the Gabriella Molinar Pediatric PMNR Research Grant. It is Dr. Ed Hurwitz from the University of Michigan for his study on the feasibility of aiding grip strength measures to body composition assessment in individuals with cerebral palsy. Um, we look forward to Ed's wonderful video. Hello, everybody. My name is Ed Hurwitz, and I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Michigan Medicine, the University of Michigan. Our Molnar grant-funded study is the feasibility of adding grip strength measures to body composition assessments in individuals, individuals with cerebral palsy. 
As you see, there's a large team, which consists of our adults with pediatric onset disability program and our cerebral palsy program in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Children with cerebral palsy have an altered body composition and low strength. They have high fat mass and low fat free mass. This is why BMI is a poor measure for them to look at their body fat mask and their risk of eventual chronic disease as they go into adulthood. Adults with cerebral palsy are at high risk for chronic diseases. The research in our laboratory has shown that they're at risk for cardiovascular diseases, renal diseases, musculoskeletal problems, respiratory diseases, and others. We do not know the natural hist history, we do not know the natural history of the risk of chronic diseases in cerebral palsy. There's this phenomenon called early aging, which involves early functional loss, which is most likely related to these chronic diseases, but we really don't understand the history. We do not know enough about altering the risk through intervention. We do not know the best tools for screening for chronic disease risk. Studies of body composition are often complex, like a DEXA scan. Other factors aside from body composition are important. Grip strength is an established biomarker of health. It's not well tested in cerebral palsy, it's highly correlated with other measures, measures of strength. A weak grip is associated with an increased risk of functional disability, fracture, cardiometabolic disease, musculoskeletal morbidity, and early mortality in studies of other populations. Weak grip is also associated with cardiometabolic health in children and adolescents. The goal of our study will be to test the clinical feasibility and reliability of body composition and hand grip, hand grip measures in a clinic setting on individuals with cerebral palsy. The long-term goal will be to have a set of measures that can assess risk and the effects of intervention on risk and potentially add these measures to the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, otherwise known as the CPRN. The specific aims of the study are aim one, to assess body composition during a clinic visit for children and adolescents, eight through 17 years old, and adults with cerebral palsy, including body mass, waist hip ratios, and skin folds. Aim two is to add grip strength measures to assess strength, and add, aim three, is to add a self or proxy report disease outcomes, and then to do some analyses on feasibility of doing the measures, and then looking at some exploratory, exploratory uh, analyses of the correlation between the measures and the chronic diseases. Our group wants to thank the Foundation for Physical Medicine Rehabilitation and the, and the folks who established the Molnar Grant for funding the study, and we look forward to sharing the results with you. Thank you, Ed, as always, well thought out and, and logically done. Our next recipient is the recipient of the 2020 Scott Nadler Passar Musculoskeletal Research Grant. Scott was a fabulous teacher, a thoughtful individual who left us oh too soon. But his memory lives on in this Musculoskeletal Research Grant Award. The awardee this year is Dr. Kuntal Chowdhury from the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. His work is entitled Platelet Dust to Extra Ve Extracellular Vessels, Mechanistic Study of the Platelet-Rich Plasma and its Role in the Treatment of Osteoarthritis. We look forward to Dr. Chowdhury's video and I'm sure it'll be enlightening. My name is Guntal Chaudhary and I am currently a second year physical medicine and rehabilitation resident at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I have long-term research interests in translational sports medicine focused on the development of precision medicine therapeutics and technological solutions. I am profoundly thankful to the Foundation for PM&R for awarding our team the Scott F. Nadler Passor Musculoskeletal Research Grant in support of our project. I would like to start by introducing you to our team. First and foremost, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Fabricia Ambrosio. She's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at UPMC and director of rehabilitation for UPMC International. Additionally, she's the founding director of the International Consortium for Regenerative Rehabilitation, the founding course director for the annual International Symposium on Regenerative Rehabilitation, 
and co-director of the NIH-funded Alliance for Regenerative Rehabilitation Research and Training. Her research has received numerous awards, including multiple Best Paper of the Year awards, and most recently she received the 2020 Carnegie Science Center Life Sciences Award. It goes without saying, I am very fortunate to start on my path to becoming a physician scientist under her guidance. I am grateful for Dr. Ambrosio's earnest dedication in helping me advance my career and teaching me the skills I need to be successful. Dr. Ambrosio is a mentor in a truest sense, and I am so thrilled to contribute this novel and innovative research to our field under her leadership. Next, please meet Dr. Amrita Sahu, my co-PI in this project. She is a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Ambrosio's lab and has an impressive resume herself. As a doctoral student, she studied the role of an anti-aging protein, Clotho, in the healthy aging of skeletal muscle, which ultimately culminated in a publication in Nature Communications in 2018. Recently, Dr. Sahu received the Delta Omega Dissertation Award by the National Honor Society of Public Health. Additionally, Dr. Sahu has received extensive training on extracellular vesicle research from the Don Gnocchi Foundation in Milan, Italy. Dr. Sahu's long-term goal is to develop targeted rehabilitation strategies for enhancing functional capacity in a geriatric population. Dr. Hirotaka Ijima is also a co-I on this project. He is a postdoctoral researcher in Dr. Ambrosio's lab and a visiting researcher at Kyoto and Keio Universities in Japan, where he was awarded the Overseas Research Fellowship from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. The primary goals of his research are to develop effective and innovative rehabilitative therapies that promote tissue regeneration and maximize functional recovery for patients with musculoskeletal disease. Given his experiences as a physical therapist and his research focus in knee osteoarthritis, Dr. Ijima utilizes integrative approaches of regenerative rehabilitation to provide his unique perspective. He was recently recognized for the highest rated research from young investigators in the International Conference for Osteoarthritis Research, Osteoarthritis Research Society International 2020. And finally, we would like to thank Dr. Alison Bean, an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at UPMC, for offering her expertise in the clinical application of orthobiologics and chondrocyte function. Working together with the Stellar team, we are seeking to demystify the mechanism of action of platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. Since the ancient times, drinking or transfusing blood of young individuals has been thought to be a potent rejuvenation method that has been utilized widely in many cultures. In the modern times, Dr. Thomas Rando and others have utilized the heterochronic parabiosis model where an old animal is surgically sutured to a young animal such that they develop a single shared circulatory system which allows for the study of circulating factors contributing to the rejuvenation of the older animal. Preliminary findings from our lab suggest that young blood exerts potent anti-aging effects on aged musculoskeletal tissue homeostasis and function. Clinicians have leveraged this supposed fountain of youth through the use of PRP in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, a highly prevalent chronic disease seen in the aging population. However, in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, the patient's own blood is injected into their failing knee joint. So we sought to answer the question whether age attenuates the effects of PRP, and if so, would young PRP help old knees? We hypothesized that young but not old PRP would help restore cartilage structure and function. This leads us to another critical question. How does this happen? We propose that extracellular vesicles, or EVs, mediate the beneficial impact of PRP derived from young individuals on restoring impaired mitochondrial function in osteoarthritic chondrocytes. Through this research, a long-term goal is to design engineered EVs that can boost PRP preparation to restore a more youthful profile of an aging and functionally deteriorating chondrocyte. To accomplish these goals, we will be culturing chondrocytes with PRP and EVs of different ages and running our in vitro experiments at the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. 
Additionally, we will be using cutting-edge imaging techniques that combine fluorescent imaging probes with flow cytometry available at the Thomas E. Starzl Biomedical Science Towers, of course with all appropriate COVID precautions. Thank you again for your generous contribution and support of this project. We are excited to contribute this novel research to our field and look forward to presenting our results in the future. What a lovely video. Congratulations, Dr. Chowdhury. She's in lovely hands with a mentor like Fabrizia. I, uh, I also want to thank all of the winners and congratulate them. And next, would like to invite Dr. Linda Kroc, who will present the Gabriella Molinar Pediatric PMNR Lifetime Achievement Award. Thanks. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the winner of the Gabriella Molnar Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Deborah Gabler Spira, my friend and colleague for many years in pediatric rehabilitation medicine. She has been active in clinical research, um, clinical care, and education throughout her career. She's a professor of pediatrics and PMNR at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and also at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, she serves as the director of the cerebral palsy program. She has worked with families and children with CP over the last 30 years and is an active collaborator um, with colleagues around the country as well as interdisciplinary teams. Um, she is a past president of the AACPDM, the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, and also is the chairman of the publication committee of that organization and a member of the Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology Editorial Board. Congratulations, Deb. Uh, thank you, and I'm, uh, I'm very humbled and honored to be given this award. I'm not standing outside of the bean, but I have a mastered screensaver on this uh, new journey into Zoom land. I want to congratulate all the research winners. I am really happy to hear that my knees have a good future, and I'm very excited to hear all of the talent that is out there. So on behalf of all the pediatric rehab um, physicians, the development of the subspecialty, and all the young talent, I want to say um, show up, do your work, pay attention, and enjoy what you're doing. And uh, it's a wonderful career, and thank you very much for this award. Thank you, Linda, for the kind introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Zafant, Dr. Kroc, and particular thanks to all of the marvelous, marvelous research that we have been able to fund through the foundation. It makes me feel so good to see the projects to hear the enthusiasm, to see the teams have been put together. And I cannot speak enough about the benefits to our field as a whole. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jana Friedley, the editor of PMNR and my friend, to present this year's Best Paper Award. Every year the foundation partners with the Purple Journal, the Eggplant Journal, whatever to recognize outstanding published physiatric research. Dr. Friedley. Hi, I'm Dr. Dana Friedley, Editor-in-Chief for the journal PMNR. I'm very pleased to announce the 2020 Foundation for PMNR and PMNR Journal Best Original Research Award. The criteria we use to identify the best research paper are the research methodology, the quality of the writing, and the clinical importance of the research. This year, we chose the study Pregnancy Outcomes in Women with Spinal Cord Injuries, a population-based study written by first author and physiatrist, Dr. Debbie Crane and her research team. This cohort study examined Washington State linked hospital birth discharge records over a 26-year period 
and compared outcomes between 529 women with spinal cord injury, paralysis, or spina bifida with singleton live birth deliveries and a comparison group of women without disabilities, uh, over 5,000. They looked at both maternal as well as infant health outcomes for two years following delivery. So first, Dr. Crane, congratulations on this well-deserved award. And maybe you can tell, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to conduct this study looking at pregnancy outcomes in women with spinal cord injury. Sure. First, I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of our entire team um, for this award uh, from uh, the journal and from the foundation. So thank you. Um, this project was part of a larger study looking at pregnancy outcomes in women with all types of different disabilities, and this was a subset analysis. I think what ultimately attracted me both to the overall project as well as this specific um, part of it was uh, the opportunity to, to study um, outcomes for women with uh, spinal cord injury and other disabilities. I think as a spinal cord injury physician, a common experience is having uh, patients or family members ask um, about a person's uh, potential for biological motherhood and being able to have some actual data to um, answer a question, you know, with some more evidence basis was um, really uh, exciting. Yeah, so there were a lot of really interesting findings in this study. Can you highlight some of the most, uh, some of the findings that you think are most clinically important for women with spinal cord injury who are considering pregnancy and for the physicians who are caring for them? Sure. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, it was really reassuring um, for both providers as well as uh, individuals, um, patients and families, uh, that the infants um, of mothers with spinal cord injury and related conditions really had no long-term adverse, uh, adverse complications. There was no increased risk of mortality or other long-term complications. Um, the other things that were, were quite interesting, I thought, were that women with spinal cord injury and related uh, conditions were more likely to be re-hospitalized due to postpartum depression or um, some type of injury. And I think that really warrants further um, investigation in the future. And then the last thing that, that surprised me quite a bit was the um, increased uh, likelihood of women with spinal cord injuries and related conditions smoking through their pregnancy. I had made the assumption that women uh, might, with these conditions might be higher uh, utilizers of healthcare and be more likely to be appropriately counseled and have interventions to um, hopefully keep them from smoking during pregnancy. So another area of future research. That's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me about your study and congratulations on a well-deserved award. Great. Thank you. And my congratulations to Dr. Crane and thank you so much to Dr. Friedley, our development chair, Dr. Lynn Gerber, the brilliant and energetic and nearly tireless Dr. Gerber, will now take a few minutes to thank you, our donors. Thanks so much. I support the foundation for PM&R because young PM&R investigators are our future. I contributed to the foundation because we all need to support research that advances the care for our patients. I strongly believe in science. It's my way of giving forward. Because it will advance PM&R significantly. Physiatry has given me so much. I contribute every year to the Summit Club because I want to continue to encourage young PM&R researchers. Research and innovation informs our future. I contribute to the Foundation for Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation because I believe in the power of research. I'm a physiatrist. Why wouldn't I? Thank you all for your comments about why you give. And I would just like to once again add my congratulations to our outstanding young investigators and encourage them to bring others along with them because through your efforts, we improve the lives of so many and we learn how to be better physicians and caregivers. I would like to acknowledge the top donors to the foundation first and to 
obviously point out the relationship between your contributions and what we have heard from our young investigators. The foundation of PM&R is fortunate to have the generous support of some of the most distinguished leaders in physiatry. We are especially grateful to our gold level donors who have given $25,000 or more. Doctors Randy Bradham, Dexan Cloan, Robert Christopher, Barbara De La Tour, Gail Gamble, Bruce Gans, myself, George Kevorkian, Linda Crack, Barry Matterson, Rosa Matterson, Drs. John Melvin and Carol Melvin Pate, Westcott Price III, Chris Ragnarsson, Betsy Sandal, and John White. Your extraordinary commitment to the Foundation for PM&R is vital to elevating and advancing the field of physiatry. Last year, the Foundation for PM&R started a new venture. We called it the Summit Club for donors who commit to make gifts of $1,000 per year or more, we'll always take more, for the next five years. Their philanthropy provides a reliable source of funding for many awards that you have heard about tonight. And our current summit members include, you'll hear some of the names again, Thiru Anaswamy, Bruce Becker, Kathy Bell, Randy Bradham, Diana Cardenas, Andrea Cheville, Bob Christopher, Larry Chow, Dexanne Cloen, Sheila Dugan, Steve Flanagan, Walter Frontera, Bruce Gans, myself, Erwin Gonzalez, Eugene Halar, Linda Crack, Myron LeBan, Frank Lagututa, Sam Mayer, John Melvin, Bill Macheo, Amish Patel, Jairo Parada, Chris Ragnarsson, Elliot Roth, Betsy Sandal, Gwen Soa, Michael Stubblefield, John White, and Sam Wu. I encourage everyone else to join us in the Summit Club. We're very grateful for your support. In addition to the two previous categories, we have sustaining members who provide year-round support for the foundation for PM&R by making an automatic monthly donation. Those generous supporters who have signed up for this program so far, and we hope more will join, include Phyllis Anderson, Nethra Ankum, Thiru Anaswamy, Dexanne Clohan, Laura Dayon, Gail Gamble, myself, Craig Langford, Thomas Lieb, Frank Lorch, Ragu Madela, Rosa Matterson, Diane Molinares, and Michael Stubblefield. Thank you so much for your unwavering support for the foundation of PM&R. Bruce, I pass the mic to our distinguished leader. Thank you so much, Lynn, and for all of your efforts in the development committee chair role. You have done such an outstanding job in moving us forward. Well, we've worked together as a very energized committee with your input and others on this Zoom, and of course, with the steadfast support and creativity of Phyllis Anderson, who has made our work so much easier. Thank you, Phyllis. It is so gratifying to see the wonderful work that has been done this year. When I went into the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation, I did so for two reasons. One is that I saw it treating the whole patient. And the second, and perhaps even the most important to me, was that I saw how potentially broad the field was in terms of unanswered questions as to how to make human beings more functional and more able across 
the age span. The work done by the young researchers to this point that you've seen is almost spine tingling to watch. The thoughts, the breadth and scope, the depth in genetics and genomics and physiology are astonishing. This year, despite the trials and tribulations caused by COVID and our obligate responses, I would like to say that we have not just survived, but the foundation has actually thrived. That is because of the absolute amazing efforts and work done by Phyllis Anderson, our executive director, the enthusiasm and energy of our tremendous and broad core of volunteers to the foundation with all of its various committees and subcommittees, the work done by our board and by the executive committee, and in particular, the enthusiasm of our young researchers in moving our field forward, truly bringing to life our mission, elevating physiatry to serve others. It is truly and deeply an honor for me to serve such a wonderful group of people. Thank you so very much for your donations, your support of time, your energy, your creativity, and I very much look forward with hope that 2021 will provide smoother sailing for all of us. A very good evening to all of you out there, and thank you for watching.